Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special webinar on drought in the Lower Mississippi River Basin. My name is Viva DeHaza, and I am the Executive Director at NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. And I would love to thank everyone who has worked to put together this special webinar, including our partners at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, our partners at the U.S. Coast Guard, NOAA's National Weather Service, as well as the Department of Agriculture. First, allow me to cover some brief housekeeping items. On this webinar, everyone is muted and the webinar is being recorded. A summary of the webinar with key takeaways, as well as links to the recording, will be sent out to all registered participants and posted on the US Drought Portal, also known as drought.gov. For questions, please use the questions box, which is located within the GoToWebinar control panel. You are welcome to enter questions at any time throughout the webinar. Please type your first name, your affiliation, and then your question. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentations. For those not familiar with NIDIS, this interagency program was established by Congress in 2006 by public law. NIDIS's mission is to enable the nation to move from a reactive to a more proactive approach to managing drought risks and impacts. A large part of NIDIS's mission is accomplished in sharing authoritative and timely information through webinars like this. This special webinar was developed in response to record low river levels in the Mississippi and significant impacts to a wide range of communities and economic sectors. Today we will begin our webinar with an overview of some key impacts that are currently being experienced along the Mississippi River Corridor with a focus on impacts to navigation presented by the U.S. Coast Guard and the American Waterways Council, as well as impacts to agriculture presented by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We will then explore what factors led to the current drought and low river conditions with presentations by experts at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the Lower Mississippi River Forecast Center, which is part of NOAA's National Weather Service. The U.S. Army Corps of, Engineer, Corps of Engineers will share actions they are taking in response to current conditions. And we will wrap up our webinar with a look ahead by sharing climate and river forecast information. We intend for this information to be useful, timely, and actionable in supporting communities and economic sectors impacted by the ongoing drought. I am now going to turn it over for some opening remarks to Colonel Andrew Panier, Deputy Commander of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Mississippi Valley Division, who is also our co-host for today's webinar. Thank you, Colonel Panier, please. Thank you, Viva, I appreciate you having me here today. Good morning to everyone out there and thanks to everyone who coordinated this event. It's been 10 years since we felt the drought that had the effects like this on our inland waterways. But that's not so far back that we've lost the institutional knowledge. And from my position, I truly appreciate the longevity we have of civilian employees throughout the government who carry that institutional knowledge, though they may change position within the same organization. One of the most important aspects of governance is to communicate both external to the government and within the government. We can often get so focused on our lanes that we miss the larger perspective of how everyone is affected during an event such as this. It is through venues such as this that we can share the institutional knowledge that has been gained from past events within each of our organizations and broaden our understanding of the situation. So I look forward today to hearing what our other presenters have to say and just building that base across all areas of expertise and then the crosstalk that follows. So thanks again for having me here today and I just look forward to this event. Thank you again, Colonel Panier. All right, let's begin this webinar. Um, let's begin with uh, webinar presentations by first focusing on several impacts of drought along the river corridor, in particular, navigation and agriculture. First up, we have Captain Eric Carrero, Director of Western Rivers and Waterways at the U.S. Coast Guard's District 8, followed by Brad Rippey, 
a meteorologist from the USDA's Office of the Chief Economist. And wrapping up this section is Paul Rohde, who serves as the Vice President of the Waterways Council Midwest Region. So first up, Captain Carrera, please. Hi, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Um, I'm Captain Carrero, 25 plus years in the Coast Guard, working in the prevention field, and I've been the director of Western Rivers and Waterways for about uh, close to two years. Uh, this incident is impacting three different sectors in the Coast Guard, sector Lower Mississippi River, sector Upper Mississippi, and sector Ohio Valley. Because of that, from the district level, we created an area command to oversee our responses. Um, this is not just one particular sector, like I mentioned, it's impacting three sectors. So as the area commander, I have all the resources available to ensure that we plan accordingly for each different area. Uh, for the low water event, although we have seen some improvement in water levels the last few days, we all know they remain historically low and continue to present challenges and navigational hazards to the marine transportation system. In response to the recent increases in water levels and the hard work of the Army Corps, we have been able to ease certain navigation restrictions along the lower Mississippi River over the past week. We're able to adapt and quickly respond to changing conditions due to the close coordination with our river stakeholders. We will continue this collaboration and will adjust waterway restrictions so we can ensure safe navigation and the continued flow of commerce. Since the outset of our response, our river tender fleet and workforce has been working around the clock in an effort to facilitate the safe flow of commerce. These cutters, we have 16 of them for the Western Rivers, and their dedicated crews are responding from home ports up and down the Western River. Like I mentioned before, we're moving our resources along the areas that we need them the most. We've been working alongside the Army Corps and our industry stakeholders to mark safe water. That's why when you see our cutters out there, they're repositioning their buoys to make sure mariners understand where we have the good water and they can safe, safely pass through the area. A very good example, uh, we have one of our cutters, uh, the Coast Guard Cutter Chippewa. Uh, during a three weeks patrol, the Chippewa traveled more than 1,000 miles and verified more than 1,000 buoys. Uh, the Coast Guard Area Command, and once again, I'm the area commander, I continue to optimize a river tender fleet and crews to ensure we can maintain the high operational tempo as we continue through this extended low water season. Uh, as we speak, uh, the river is open, we are moving traffic, and uh, we have some restrictions in place, and they are restrictions imposed by industry. Um, what we're trying to do is we are fully committed to safeguarding the marine transportation system, and uh, due to the important work of the Coast Guard and our partners, these vitally important waterways remain open. As we have done since the beginning of this extremely challenge, challenging low water season, we'll continue our posture to ensure everybody understand the challenges ahead, and we continue to put our people and resources uh, to, to ensure our waterways remain open. Um, in addition, uh, some of the measurements we, we took in the past we know we're not alone in this response. We've been working with other local and state partners as well as industry. A uh, very good example at uh, Sector Lower Mississippi River, we were able to create a marine transportation system recovery unit. And it is a group comprised of Coast Guard members, industry members, and state local partners. Every time we have a restriction or a closure, they take a look at uh, the vessels that are waiting to transit and they make the recommendation for which vessels they need to transit first. Once again, it is a team effort, and every time we have a closure, we're gonna be using this team 
because we understand it needs to be a team effort. So all hands on board to ensure the safe passage of our vessels. Um, that's uh, the, the brief that I have for you guys today. And I'll be passing uh, to Mr. Brad Ripley for his brief. Thank you. Thank you very much for that update. My name is Brad Rippey. I'm a meteorologist in USDA's Office of the Chief Economist. I've been in this position for 24 years and in the federal government for 34 years. And although I am a meteorologist by trade, I've spent enough years around economists that a little bit of the economics has begun to rub off on me. So I'm gonna veer off a little bit into economics today and let the, uh, some of the other folks handle the meteorology and the hydrology. So starting off today, I just wanna show a trace here that shows spot rates along with one month and three month out barge rates for the Mississippi River at St. Louis. And you can see clearly from the trace here that in September and October, there was a dramatic increase in barge spot rates along the middle Mississippi River and incredibly rates that had been running less than $20 per metric ton for much of the year had all of a sudden spiked to more than $100 per metric ton for spot rates. And so that forced a lot of folks who were just starting to harvest corn and soybeans to think futureward and say, hey, I can get a better rate if I push that off one or three months. And so recently, in the last couple of weeks, prices have come back down more in line with historical averages, but still are, remain a bit elevated. And so we're now running about $40 per metric ton, down quite a bit, but still above what we had been seeing for uh, the past couple of years. Next slide, please. Looking at some of the barge movements and barge tonnages moving down the Mississippi, Again, partly because of prices and partly because of lack of uh, being able to navigate down the river just due to the low levels, we saw a really dramatic drop during September and October in both barge movements. Again, you can see here that we've been running along the three-year average, give or take 400 barges per week moving up and down the Mississippi, all of a sudden plummeted into the one to 200 range News stories were everywhere about how barges were backed up in various locations. So a dramatic drop off, again, price being a part of the factor, but also just sheer uh, logistics being another part of it, seeing that big drop off at a time when corn and soybeans were being harvested, typically would be moving down to the port of New Orleans for export. So it really backed things up for a couple of months. We are seeing some recovery, but we're still below three-year averages, both for barge movements and for the tonnage as you look at both graphs, very similar picture there. Next slide, please. So how that translated into lower crop prices, well, if you're putting more into moving the grain and oil seeds around, that does have an impact on the bottom line for the farmers upstream and those who are buying the corn and soybeans and then shipping them. So you can see on the bottom, well, first of all, we have corn on the left, soybeans on the right, and if you look back a year to October 2021, you can see that everything's pretty close. There's not much of a spread between the prices at the Gulf and inland locations, less than $2 in both the case of corn and soybeans last year. But this year as the crisis, the river highway transportation crisis mounted, we started seeing big spikes in the cost of moving agricultural products downstream. And that led to some of these spot prices going up to two or even uh, over $3. So that's really cutting into the profit margins for some of these producers, especially along the river. Now, as you move away from the river, there's other options. You can move the grain and oil seeds by rail, for example, but that impact is pretty obvious. We've seen things coming back a little bit more in line with what we'd like to see here in November, but still a significant difference from what we saw this time a year ago when everything was pretty flat there wasn't a big difference between the Gulf and further upstream. Next slide. Soybean basis, and that is really just the, the price compared to the Chicago Board of Trade futures price. Significant uh, cuts in the amount of 
uh, profit for product leaving through the lower Mississippi Valley. We saw a spike above $3 compared to the Chicago Board of Trade futures price. That has come back, and about earlier this week, I believe it was a, a buck 82 above. So again, we're still seeing, especially in the lower Mississippi Valley, significant cuts in what you would like to see compared to that CBOT price on soybeans. So um, you know that's that's a problem still going forward. We're not out of this crisis, but we have seen some improvements in September and October. Next slide. And then finally, you have to think of the highway as a two-way street. Not only do you have agricultural produce, uh, corn and soybeans moving downstream, but there's things trying to move upstream too. And this time of year, one of the big things is fertilizer, as well as fuel and other agricultural products moving into the Midwest. So with respect to fertilizer, you can see that for urea in particular, significant increase, again, it follows the same trace there with that big increase in spot prices for urea on the left slide during that September, October crisis. We've started to see prices come back down more in line with what we saw earlier in the year, but still somewhat elevated, especially as you move further north where the transport costs are higher moving into the upper part of the basin. And then for diammonium phosphate, monoammonium phosphate, not much of an impact there, but the one thing that's notable there is that the spread, the, the spread between the Gulf and inland locations has actually grown in recent weeks as prices have come down at, at New Orleans, but they're still somewhat elevated as you move to the, to the north. And then I believe the uh, final slide, The Grain Transportation Report, a great resource that's a U.S. Department of Agricultural product issued by a, a neighboring agency, the Agricultural Marketing Service. There is a new report out this morning. This is last week's report, and the headline there, the first article, was talking about the barge transport prices coming back down, but still elevated compared to what we've been experiencing recently. And then that's all I have for this morning, and I will pass it along to Paul Rohde for the third presentation in this group of talks. Thanks, Brad. I'm Paul Rohde with the Waterways Council. Can you hear me all right, Brad? Yes, we can. Thanks, Paul. Fantastic. Waterways Council is a trade association nonprofit organization made up of the inland carriers on our waterways, the shippers, manufacturers of products moved by barge or the agriculture products. Uh, that Brad just talked about, grown by America's farmers. Uh, towboats provide the lowest cost, most fuel efficient, safest, lowest carbon footprint mode among surface modes for transportation. It's preferred by shippers when river transportation is an option. Barges move the commodities that are the underpinnings of our economy without interacting within our neighborhoods or our morning commutes. You don't hear about towboats in the morning traffic reports. Um, we're out of sight, out of mind as far as public perception in the transportation sector because you usually, again, don't hear about us, except for now. We have an unprecedented disruption to river traffic, especially on the, the Mississippi River, especially on the lower Mississippi River. Uh, bottom line up front, barges are experiencing reduced capacity and disruption in getting to their destinations as efficiently as they normally do during regular uh, normal operations. Captain Carrero mention restrictions imposed on the industry. That's in part because the industry is all about safety first. It is a very challenging working environment, working on our rivers, and so safety has got to be the first priority. Uh, we have river closures to allow for dredging. Thank you, Colonel Paneer and everybody with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for doing what you do to keep us safe and keep our rivers moving America's products. Uh, but that results in sometimes long lines of tows, and a tow is a towboat plus strings of barges put together, uh, waiting for a particular river stretch to reopen and allow those tows to get through. Uh, the dredges then go on to survey other spots and identify next problem areas. We also have hindered operations as the river channel continues to shift, and you can see an example on this slide here, uh, continues to shift and um, it, it presents certain challenges trying to find the navigation channel. And so thank you to the U.S. Coast Guard and Captain Carrero for getting navigation buoys out there to mark the channel. And I think that will be 
a continuing challenge, even as we get river water, uh, pardon me, even as we get water into our rivers, is making sure that nav channel is marked. We've also had restrictions in drafts, so that's how deep you can load a barge. We're loading about 30% less than normal conditions and have been for weeks and, and months now. Um, that's not just lighter loads on barges, but also fewer barges that you can configure into the size of a tow. And if it gets worse, we could be looking at barges not being able to reach the loading facilities because they're just too far out of the navigation channel. Uh, so grain elevators um, and other riverside facilities. I hope that's not the case, but that's a, a possibility. Um, again, we've had restrictions to tow size, how many barges can be strung together to make that tow pushed by a towboat, which is why it's called a towboat and not a tugboat, fun fact. Um, so dredging continues. The good news is boats are now able to pass in most instances during dredging operations before the river would completely stop. But right now, today, this morning, there are at least two spots where there are at least 23 towboats held up. I'm not sure how many barges, but uh, just about 30 minutes ago, I got that news. So most of the dredging is allowing for slow, albeit slow, but river passage. But there are still some spots where it is closing the river outright. At its worst, on October 11th, we had almost 200 boats, 3,000 barges waiting in troubled spots. I did the math real quick. That's the equivalent of 210,000 trucks. So if you put those trucks bumper to bumper, They'd stretch almost 3,000 miles. That's enough to line up trucks bumper to bumper from New Orleans to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and back again almost two and a half times, just to give you an example of the tonnage that barges can use, uh, can move on a regular basis. So I'd say right now we've got a stabilized crisis. Um, prior to commitments to shipments are being met. Spot bids are a little bit uh, uh, less so, but that is improving. Our operational conditions as far as tow sizes, normally on the lower mess, you'd be moving about 45 barges uh, with one boat. We're restricted to about 25 uh, southbound and 35 northbound. A lot of those barges have to be empty, though, in order to um, not hit bottom. And so that is changing uh, the operations that our, our tow boats are normally seeing. Uh, you're loading at about 1,300 tons per barge versus the normal would be maybe 1,900 tons per barge. Uh, you've got tows limited in width, a uh, draft of about nine feet, six inches southbound and nine feet northbound. Um, you've got uh, uh, those width restrictions that are, uh, again, challenging the operations. So what is this all costing? Well, that's kind of hard to tell. I can't tell you that the impacts are in the billions of dollars. Again, it's a little hard to quantify with an exact target amount, but let me try to unpack some of it. Inland waterway shipping saves the nation seven to nine billion dollars a year in shipping freight costs. And that's been hindered, of course, so far as shipping costs have increased. And it may get worse if impacts to um, our river levels uh, continue. But as, as we've heard, we expect a little bit of relief as far as rains go. Um, the value of the commodities moved on our rivers are at least $130 billion a year. So quick math, that's over $32 billion per quarter, but that's not really telling the whole story because most of our agriculture exports are moving in the fourth quarter. I can go through some other numbers as far as what it costs, but I know we want to get other speakers on. So let me just give you one quick takeaway. The industry is resilient. We are working with the Corps and the Coast Guard to manage this crisis and minimize the impact of getting product to destinations. Um, Mariners are working out best how to determine the order of movement, and they're an industry that's frankly used to coming together. Companies that are competing against each other during regular business, uh, but they're all in the same operational challenges, whether it is uh, low water or high water, or working with our 90-year-old lock and dam infrastructure. They're all working together in the same river and doing their best to uh, make sure everybody continues to move the products that keeps America working. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, and I'm happy, I'll be around happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you, um, all three of our speakers. Thank you to Captain Carrero, to Brad Rippey, and to Paul Rohde, excellent presentations. Okay, now we are going to turn our attention to why we are seeing these impacts today, and answer the question, how did we get here? 
So we will first hear from Don Duncan from the US Army Corps of Engineers, Mississippi Valley Division. And then Don will be followed by Victor Murphy from NOAA's National Weather Service Southern Region Headquarters. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Don. Good morning. Uh, thanks for everyone who's who's been here today. Uh, ne next slide, please. Uh, so to, to get us started here, I want to give a background on the Mississippi Basin, uh, just so everyone has this picture in their head as, as we continue this, this discussion on how we got here. So the Mississippi Valley covers over 1.2 million square miles, including thir portions of 32 states within the contiguous U.S. and portions of Canadian provinces. Uh, this, to this watershed covers nearly 40% of the land mass of the continental U.S. Although and, and so, as you can see, we're focusing today on the lower Mississippi, which is that yellow portion of the watershed down, down near the bottom. Uh, one important thing to know, though, is that we, the upper portions of the watershed include the Missouri Basin in red, the upper Mississippi in pink, and the Ohio Basin in purple. And of, of those watersheds, uh, the Ohio contributes nearly 60% of the flow at Cairo, Illinois, which is the location right at the southern tip of Illinois, uh, which we consider the start of the lower Mississippi River. So keep the extents of, of the watershed here in mind as we move through these, these next slides. Next slide, please. So an, another important aspect of the, of the basin, I've got the Ohio and the Missouri River shown here, is that there are federally controlled reservoirs uh, scattered throughout. Uh, and, and some of these reservoirs are, are typically operated on curves that hold a higher level in the summer and then draw down to a lower level in the winter to prepare for more storage for spring rain. Uh, the, 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 tip, the typical time frame of, of this drawdown it, it happens in the November time frame. So not all reservoirs are operated in this manner, uh, but, uh, you know, for example, the, the Missouri Basin is operated in a different manner due to the much more complex operations required to, to balance multiple authorized purposes. Next slide, please. So an important thing to note here, we've, we've got a note there at Cairo, Illinois. So if, if we look at the flow in the lower Mississippi River and, and using Natchez, Mississippi as an indicator, assuming 100% of our flow is there, on average, 90% of the flow that is going to pass through the lower Mississippi River is already in the river at Cairo, Illinois. And as I mentioned before, 60% of that comes out of the Ohio Basin. And so the remaining 10% comes in from streams that are downstream of Cairo. Next slide, please. So if we step back in time, to October of last year, sort of the end of last year, and, and we look at the drought monitor for the U.S., we could see that portions of the upper Mississippi Basin in Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and, and Iowa were already in drought at that time. And uh, much of the upper Missouri Basin was also in drought, uh, leading to lower than normal uh, water levels within the Missouri Basin. Next slide, please. For these next few slides, I'm going to talk against different pieces of this slide. I, I know it looks like a spaghetti monster right now, but I'll explain what all these different lines mean. Lines mean. So we, we took the period from 1967 to present, and, and we, we used that as sort of the modern uh, record, uh, as, as at that time, most of the reservoirs that were constructed in the, in the Mississippi Basin had been constructed. So any, any beneficial low water impacts to those are, are already included in the record. Uh, so we, we've got an average line, which is that dashed black line that represents the daily average uh, stage at Cairo, Illinois for every day of the year. Uh, the, the heavy black lines represent the, the highest stage up above and the lowest stage we, we've recorded since 1967 at Cairo. We've also added a few drought years here, the, the year 2000 in pink, 2012 in green, and 1998 in red. And then 2022 is shown in blue as much as we've got this year leading into mid-November. Next slide, please. So if, if we continue from October, now we're looking at November and December of 2021, you can see uh, the, the, the graphics on the right are what our percent of 
precip for that month compared to the average. So browns means we, we, we received less precip than average. Deeper browns means considerably less. And then the teal colors, is the darker they get, uh, it means above average precip. And if, if you see no shading at all, a white area means we were right around average. So in November of 2021, the entire basin had below average precip. In December, uh, it was a little bit of a mixed bag with, with portions of the upper Mississippi uh, northern end receiving above average precip, uh, a good chunk of the Ohio basin receiving pretty close to average or above average, and then parts of that lower Missouri basin were receiving uh, below average precip. But if we look at that blue line at the start of January, we were right about on that average uh, that average uh, record. Next slide, please. So now if, if we look at January through May of 2022, uh, from a precip standpoint, for the most part, we were right on average. And if you look at how that blue line bounces around that gray or that black dash line, uh, we were you know, hovering around average for the year. Uh, if you look at the start of June, we landed right on that average number. Next slide, please. So the month of June, uh, most of the basin had average or below average precipitation. And you could see that the stages on at Cairo kind of took a nosedive at that point. And by the end of the month, we were we were well below average. Next slide, please. So in July, with a drier, with a drier than average June, uh, most of our reservoirs were likely near that summer per pool, um, and and so any spring rains we had that that pushed those reservoirs above their normal curve were probably drained out. And if we look at the precipitation and and it it it, it sort of just kind of averages out, uh, but still through the month of July we 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 kind of held steady, and then right near the end of the month. Um, we received those rainfalls that, that caused significant flooding in, in the city of St. Louis and in eastern Kentucky. And so those bumped us up a little back above average by the end of the month. Next slide, please. So in August, again, near average precip occurred, uh, but below average precip in, in the lower parts of the Missouri basin. And so by the end of the month, stages fell below the average. Uh, going into September. Next slide. So in, in September, most of the basin, again, received below average, and, and the Ohio started receiving below average precip as well. And so our, our stages stayed low, and by the end of the month, we were dropping down and actually setting new modern daily record lows, where you can see that blue line dips below the heavy black line. Next slide, please. Again, in October, most of the basin, again, received below average precipitation, uh, again, hitting the Ohio. Uh, and, and remember, the Ohio contributes most of the flow at Cairo. Uh, so, again, we, we stayed low and continued setting these lower than average uh, daily stages. Uh, another consideration is that in this October, November timeframe, some of those reservoirs begin that water that uh, winter drawdown process to get down to their their winter pool level uh so that provided some flow augmentation and if that hadn't happened uh we probably would have seen even lower stages uh the current Cairo forecast so as you see the blue line jumps up a little bit uh the current forecast in the next day or two is to to get us up near 20. uh if you see the years 2000 and 2012 in green and pink uh, we bumped up around 20 in those years as well uh, before dipping down and setting more daily lows. So next slide, please. So here in mid-November, uh, the result of the drought monitor is drought has expanded from last October over nearly the entire basin. Uh, the, that rainfall we received from the remnants of Nicole in the last couple of weeks are what caused the bump we're seeing now. Uh, on the lower Miss at Cairo, uh, and 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 have probably held off that eastern portion of the Ohio basin from from actually sinking into drought. So now I'll pass it off to to Victor to continue our discussion on how did we get here.
Okay, Donald, thank you. Uh, that's a great segue. Um, a couple of things um, that I really want to point out or emphasize from Donald's presentation. The first one is the seasonality and the stream flow. Uh, as you can see from his charts, um, you know, the stream flows at, at Cairo tend to peak in March. Um, multiple reasons for that. You know, we're coming off winter time. There's no, no vegetation pretty much, no agriculture, no, no irrigation going on. Uh, high runoff, whatever precip does occur, tends to run off due to the lack of vegetation. And also the, the snow melt, whatever snowpack might be in the ground from the winter time, tends to run off you know, during that March time period. So the river itself at Cairo tends to be highest in March and, and as also as you show, it tends to be lowest in September. So got seasonality of stream flow, but also I wanna emphasize the, the seasonality of the precipitation. So the interesting thing to me when seeing Donald's presentation was the fact that on June 1st at Cairo, the river is actually near normal as far as stages go. Um, so let's look at sort of what happened after this. Let's sort of start focusing on June 1st onward and see what happens. So next slide, please. So June, June is far and away the wettest month of the year in the Missouri and the upper Mississippi Basin. Um, you can see the, the blue areas. These are uh, climate division ma uh, maps of the particular states with climate division uh, within delineated within each state. You can see parts of North Dakota, Montana, and South Dakota receive about 20% of their average yearly rainfall in the month of June. That's, you know, it should be if you just to take, uh, you know, 100% uh, divided by 12, you, you know, if it was evenly distributed, you'd have 8% roughly per month for precip. Uh, but you can see there's a strong seasonality here with the upper part of the Missouri Basin there and the Mississippi also getting um a very high amount of their yearly precip in june once again it's so far and away the wettest month of the year um the ohio basin which is very key because it provides 60 percent of the water downstream as uh donald pointed out the ohio doesn't have a whole lot of seasonality pretty much um you don't have a whole lot of peaks and valleys on the in the yearly rainfall by month it tends to be pretty consistent next slide so let's move into july second wettest month of the year um, one thing you can see the, the colors drop off there, which means the, the percentage of the yearly rainfall that occurs in the month of July has decreased some since June. But nonetheless, you can see a really strong tilt there in the uh, upper Missouri uh, basin and the upper Mississippi for uh, precip. And, and this is, you know, this is the only real source of uh, water, you know, for runoff for, for keeping Mississippi flowing, you know, during the summer and into the uh, end of the fall. Next slide. Okay, so August third wettest month in general. Um, once again, you can still see the the wet pattern there in the Missouri and the Upper Mississippi, and you can see the uh, Ohio Basin pretty much now is uh, right right around. Like I said, not a whole lot of seasonality. It's a, it, sort of a you know the equal percentage of the of the rainfall occurs in August is what you'd expect it to occur. You know, if you divide it you know across the entire year. Next slide. Okay, September you can see it turns drier. Um, the Ohio Basin starts to dry out slightly, still a little bit wet up there in the upper uh, parts of the Mississippi. Next slide. And then by October, um, you can see the rainfall has pretty much come to a, you know, well, the yearly, the yearly, the monthly contribution of the yearly rainfall total um, in the month of October starts to diminish to being, you know, less than, you know, pretty much less than 5%. So it's one of the drier parts of the year, not just for the, for these three basins, but also for the country, nation as a whole. So next slide. So I'm gonna focus on June 1st. So anyway, so um, if we look at three month periods, um, the May, June, July time period, um, MJJ, if you will, is once again, the wettest part of the year. So we um, uh, or suspect if you could slice and dice this more, probably be uh, mid to late May through, um, mid to late uh, uh, through August perhaps, but as far as actually being the wettest, but you can see during the three month period, um, parts of the Dakotas, Montana, and you know, Nebraska, Kansas, uh, and even into uh, Minnesota, you know, 45 to 50% of the annual rainfall occurs during these, these three months. So, you know, typically the average, you know, if, if once again, if it was, if it was perfectly uh, averaged, you'd have 25%, 
you know, during every three month period during the year, you'd have 25% of the yearly precip occurring during that three month period. But you can see here with the strong seasonality, um, you know, 45 to 55% uh, of the yearly precip occurs during these three months. So um, this is pretty much the lifeline of the uh, stream flows for the Mississippi, upper Mississippi and the uh, Missouri basin, um, especially in the summer and into the fall, which we know is our, when we have our, our uh, lull as far as stream flows go, this May through uh, May, June, July time period is huge. You can see the Ohio basin, once again, not really a whole lot of seasonality in that time period. Uh, next slide. Okay, so why so bad in 2022? Well, actually the combination of factors and, a, and sort of a cumulative impact type thing and sort of like the domino theory, if you will. Um, the, the first shoe to fall was pretty much the Missouri Basin. Um, you know, we had cumulative impacts uh, of various events in each basin, which, you know, culminated at the wrong time of the year. So Missouri Basin, start off with Missouri Basin, that's sort of the first shoe to fall, if you will. Uh, the Missouri Basin has really been an extended drought for about the last two to three years. Um, the below graph is from the U.S. Drought Monitor, and it shows the uh, uh, hydrologic unit uh, code or the HUC code number 10, which is for the Missouri Basin, and it shows the percent of the basin in drought. And you can see here in the bottom right, uh, at least 25% of the basin has been in moderate drought or worse since July of 2020, so about two years. Um, you look at 2012 here, um, it was not uh, a little bit more severe perhaps, but shorter term as far as drought goes. So um, the first shoe, like I said, we've had, we've had a persistent two to three year drought across Missouri Basin. You know, with a drought of that duration, you know, what are the long-term impacts on runoff? Difficult to say, but I think it's probably safe to say that, you know, in the long term, they've had a lot less runoff than usual multiply that over a two year to three year period and it becomes pretty significant. Next slide. So as we get to the shorter term, um, using data from the National Center for Environmental Intelligence or NCEI, um, the past 36 months in the Northern Rockies Climate Division or the region, if you will, includes these five states here, Montana, North Dakota, down through Nebraska, uh, that 36 month period ending in uh, October, of 2022 has been the fourth driest on record going back to 1895. And in fact, that 36 month period um, or three year period has been the driest since 1935, 36 and 37. So a 36 month period ending in October 35, October 36, October 37. Of course, we're talking Dust Bowl days here. Um, those were the driest uh, three year periods um, in, in that region. And so, basis about 175 years. Um, and you can see overall though, there's a blue line here on the graph in the bottom right, the overall, the actual rainfall for the entire basin as a whole is actually increasing about two, uh, two inches per centimeter, excuse me, per century. So um, in the face of overall a wetter pattern, boom, we have this, this two year to three year drought. Next slide. Okay, so looking shorter term, uh, combine here the uh, the uh, Upper Missouri Basin with the uh, Upper Mississippi Basin, and so for the five month period from June through October, both the Upper Missouri and the Upper Mississippi uh, had their limit driest June through October in 128 years of data. So basically, bottom 10% um, precip over a five month period. And now we're talking two bases. So now the, the Upper Mississippi starts coming into play. And once again, so it turned dry in Upper Mississippi starting in June. Um, once again, we know we saw how much rainfall occurs during that June, July time period. Not a good time of year for it to be going dry. Um, and of course, short-term dryness in the Ohio Basin, although not, not, not that significant, you can see the lighter brown color there. The Ohio was also starting starting to trend drier. Next slide. And then so the, the final domino to fall or the coup de gras, if you will was about a four to eight week flash drought or rapid onset drought in the Ohio Basin uh, from Ohio, from the comp, really from about Cairo area uh, eastward uh, into Ohio and uh, Kentucky. And the bottom right chart here is the US drought monitor. It's a change in uh, drought classification over eight week period of two months time. 
you can see the darker browns here are about a two to three category drop, uh, drop in the drought monitor uh, designation uh, for that area. So you can see a lot of Kentucky here, uh, parts of Ohio, parts of Indiana have had a two to three category drop. So basically going from no drought to either D2, severe drought, or D3, um, extreme drought. And so this, so starting, starting in September is when the Ohio Basin, uh, if you will, became the, the final domino or the final shoot of drop, and it joined into the, the fray to help, you know, add into the cumulative impact. Next slide. Um, and if you slice and dice the numbers a little bit, little bit more, which, which I did, um, you know, monthly slides, obviously, you know, you have a, the day, uh, you know, start the first of the month and the 31st, but if you peel the onion back a little bit closer, um, the flash drought of the Ohio Basin in September into October of this year, I think was really probably the, you know, the, the, the icing on the cake, if you will, or final nail in the coffin for the dryness. So the six week period of rainfall at Louisville from September 12th through October 24th was, uh, 0.21% less than a quarter inch of rainfall, 4% of normal, uh, the driest period on record. And the records at Louisville go back to 1872. So the, gr the graph in the bottom right, the uh, brown line here is the uh, normal precip. Uh, the other lines are 2000 and 2012. You can see they got decent rainfall in both those other drought years. But the red line here in the very bottom is 2022, just absolute flat line pretty much, driest ever. Um, how about other areas on the Ohio Basin? Cincinnati, same time period, 9% of normal rainfall. Second driest since 1871. I think the only, the, I think the only drier year was 1936 or so. Evansville, uh, further downstream, um, 0 0.07 hundredths over a six week period. 2% of normal driest on record since 1897. So the, what really, really, you know, exacerbated thing at the very exacerbated condition at the very end was just the big drop off in contributions from the Ohio Basin during that six week period from September, mid September into uh, mid to late October. Next slide. And also, uh, that's a little bit anecdotal, but, um, you know, we got no help from the tropics this year. Ordinarily, uh, you would expect some tropical cyclones uh, or, uh, to maybe make landfall in the Gulf of Mexico and move northward up into the Ohio Valley or the even the lower Mississippi or upper Mississippi, uh, not too uncommon. Um, this year, uh, this does not show Nicole, which actually brushed up here from Tallahassee, Florida, up into, I believe, into western parts of Virginia. And it did actually help things out. Uh, that's, that's what's caused the recent uh, increase was contributions from Nicole, which just barely clipped the far eastern part of the Ohio Basin. But you can see here in general, there was no land falling tropical cyclones anywhere, save from the Florida Big Bend westward in the Gulf of Mexico. And that certainly didn't help any. And that was probably one of the factors in the Ohio stream flow sort of dropping off so, pre so precipitously there in September, October. And um, I went back, it was the first time since 2016, there was no land falling tropical cyclones. So basically about a one in five year event, if you will. And that's the last slide I have, and Viva, I will uh, kick it back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you to you, Victor, and to Don. So um, let's continue to move on with our presentations. A common question that we hear is what actions are being taken to address current low river levels and drought conditions in order to reduce future impacts? So I'm going to invite uh, my colleague, Colonel Andrew Pinier, to come back on. We're for fortunate to have with us today, Colonel Pinier, who is going to briefly, um, which you heard from briefly, um, who is going to speak uh, to the actions that are being taken right now by the Army Corps of Engineers. So Colonel Pinier, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thank Victor, you and good morning go and, again. Thank you. Um, uh, Victor, you can go ahead and turn off your camera and then we'll go ahead and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Colonel. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to highlight the end of Victor's presentation there, how a blessing to some is a curse to others. So we did not have any hurricane events make landfall in the um, Gulf Coast region, west of the Panhandle of Florida, truly a blessing to those in Louisiana that have suffered over the last couple of years, but ends up being a curse because we don't get the rain across the Ohio Valley that results in a large contributor to this drought. So the ironies of mother nature. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide, please. 
Thanks. While much of our attention usually falls on floods, 2022 has returned our attention to the drought conditions. And I just wanted to highlight here in these two photos, they represent a 50 foot difference in river stages at roughly the same location on the river. So these photos were taken at Cairo, Illinois. One was an all time high, which was in 2011 of 61.72 feet. And the other, the all time low occurring this year of 4.83 feet. So that's a difference of 56.9 feet on the river. And of course, as you look at these two events, right, how we have to approach them are, are vastly different between a flood and a drought. Typically, we can forecast a flood much sooner than a drought. Droughts are not as easy to forecast because of multiple variables that you've heard in the uh, prior presenters. And historically speaking, we don't encounter droughts nearly as often as floods. But for USACE, we have to be prepared for both scenarios. And we have to understand the differences that are required to react to both scenarios. The drought continued to expand eastward across the Great Mississippi Valley, Greater Mississippi Valley, uh, with most of Missouri, Arkansas, and the Lower Mississippi Basins being in moderate drought, as was mentioned. And then also we see the drought across the Ohio Basin, all that impacting this and how we respond. There has been some current rainfall in the past week. Some of that was a result of Hurricane Nicole that Victor just highlighted, and that has been beneficial to the Lower Mississippi River. So for my next couple of slides, I'm going to focus on the ongoing low water event that we're experiencing right now. But I just wanted to highlight to all of you the huge swings that we in the Corps of Engineers face on our levees, on our control and training structures on the navigation channel in the Mississippi River. And it's important that we design those projects on the river to be able to support the needs of both events. Next slide, please. Between the rainfall over the Ohio Valley from Hurricane Nicole and the rainfall that we've received over this past week, the Mississippi River south of Cairo has seen an increase in depth. This has reduced the burden on our dredges for the lower Mississippi, and we're continuing to work in the shallow draft ports and along the Red and the Washita Rivers to support operations there as we find some small relief on the lower Mississippi from the rainfall that has come. The area of concern for us remains the Middle Mississippi River, which is that reach from St. Louis to Cairo. The upper Middle Mississippi has had a very slight increase in depth due to rain this week, but that rain, the wave of that on the river is going to pass within four to five days. We also anticipate that the Missouri River flow reductions will begin on November 19th, and those impacts will start to be felt on the main stem of the Mississippi River on November 29th, with the full impacts being in mid-December. The reduction in flows from the Missouri will result in about a three-foot drop on the Middle Mississippi River, and we predict the stage of St. Louis will drop to minus 5.5 feet by mid-December. So what does that mean in terms of our operations and the effect or navigation? When we, when we reach that stage, it requires extended closures of dredging operations. So we try to operate right now in roughly a 12 on, 12 off period. So 12 hours on the river dredging and then open the river to navigation for 12 hours to facilitate that flow of traffic. But when we reach these um, extreme conditions, then it's going to require that we commit dredge assets to one location until they're complete there, which could extend closures 24 to 72 hours to complete that. And then the dredge will move from that location to the next needed location and stay there until they complete operations. The other thing that is impactful to the middle Mississippi uh, will become if we reach a stage of minus seven feet, then we go back to what we saw in 2011 of major concern, 2012 was the rock pinnacles. So at this stage, we've removed much of that in the previous drought, but it would, it would cause at this stage a reduction in the width of the river to 200 feet. And so in addition to longer closures from dr for dredging operations, that's gonna also increase the restrictions on the river on the toes as they try to go through areas where we get narrower and narrower in width. We remain confident 
at this time that our dredging operations will keep the river open. We will maintain a, a nine foot depth in the channel, especially on the lower mess because of the rain that's, that has occurred from Hurricane Nicole fallout and then just throughout the past week and, and the forecast as we look out. And so we, we're confident that the lower Mississippi River um, will remain in good condition and will be usable. And uh, hopefully we will see a bump in that as we get more rain. But the concern does remain in the middle of Mississippi River where we are committing more dredging assets to support that. So that the types of dredges we use, there's two, the dustpan dredge and the cutterhead dredge. The dustpan dredge is what's most beneficial in the middle Mississippi reaches. And we only have four of those, three in the core and one that is a contract dredge. We have all four of those operating on the river right now. And as we see uh, decreasing depths on the gauges in uh, St. Louis, we'll continue to move assets to that location. So our cutter head dredges are largely in support right now of the uh, Red and Washita rivers and our shallow draft harbors while we keep the dustpan dredges on the main stem and particularly again in that middle reach now that we're seeing some relief on the lower Mississippi River. The other piece of this is the constant coordination. So staying coordinated across our division, Mississippi Valley Division, and the Lakes and Rivers Division over that controls the Ohio River, flows the, the Cumberland and the Tennessee Rivers and how those flow into the Mississippi. And then also the Northwest Division, which uh, is where the Missouri River falls. In addition to that, it's that constant coordination that's been mentioned with the Coast Guard, supporting the Coast Guard. Uh, we have one motor, motor vessel, the Gurgit, that we uh, use to assist the Coast Guard the best we can in in placing navigation buoys and patrolling the channel, and then just coordinating with navigation industry and being open and transparent to them on, on what we're doing, where we're operating, and how we're supporting. Next slide, please. And so really, it's an event like this, right? It's communication that's key, and that's what we have right here, and that's what we have every day. This is an ongoing and, and daily occurrence uh, across Mississippi Valley Division to coordinate and communicate externally with navigation industry and the Coast Guard, and then internally with the other agencies or the other divisions across um, the Corps of Engineers, but, but also internally to our districts, talking with the regional shallow draft teams, the deep draft teams down in New Orleans, to ensure that we're moving our dredging assets to the most critical points as quickly as we can, and, and anticipating where those points are gonna be in the future. And the other piece of that is then ensuring that if we need additional assets, we have already identified where they are and the measures that we would have to take to get those assets in place early enough to have them on the river and helping. In addition to that, some of the other things besides dredging uh, that are going on that we do to support this is the saltwater wedge. This is south, very, very far south on the river. Uh, as, as the river gets low, and the water from the Gulf pushes in, we get a saltwater intrusion that moves up the river. And this can impact uh, intakes that lead to drinking water systems for communities along that portion of the river. And so we have actually put a, a wedge in place, a saltwater, uh, we, we put an underwater sill in place to counter the saltwater wedge. And we've put that in to a negative 55 feet and that allows to stop the wedge from moving up the river, but we still see impacts south of that on intakes in communities. And so we're supporting them with uh, reverse osmosis systems and pumps to help them treat water that's coming in. And then I've already talked briefly about the pinnacles. The last thing I'd like to talk about here that we have not uh, discussed up to this point is there's a lack of rainfall we see the event of the drawdown on the Missouri will have an impact of up to a three foot drop. But then we're also moving closer and closer uh, to the season where the northern reaches of the river are going to freeze. And so there's a higher chance that we start to see freezing on the river on the upper Mississippi River, and that additionally reduces flow. And again, that's not enough to have a large impact on what we term the lower Mississippi River south of Cairo but that stretch from St. Louis to Cairo it does have an impact. And that is important to navigation on the entire Mississippi because the Illinois waterway stays open all year long. And the Illinois, 
the Illinois waterway relies on that middle reach of the Mississippi River in order to transport things up to and down from the Great Lakes to the lower Mississippi and out to the to the ports on the Gulf Coast. And so we see the additional concern moving into the winter of the freezing and the locking of water into that ice and then less flows coming down. And so that will again have the same effect that I've said before, which is increasing the time we have to commit dredges to any given location to complete their operations, which creates extended periods of closure on the river until the dredge is complete and we can move it to the next needed location. And so, you know, the, the most important takeaway of all this is that we do see that we can keep the river open to a nine foot channel, but it's going to be with increased restrictions as the river continues to drop and it could be um, closures, temporary closures for extended periods, 24 to 72 hours as dredges need to concentrate on one area and complete the mission before moving to the next. That's all I have, thank you. Colonel, thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. I learned quite a bit, but I, the big takeaway is how coordinated this effort has been and how much communication it takes um, to get the job done. So thank you again for, for your presentation and for joining us. Okay, moving to our last set of presentations, um, we are focusing on, with these set of presentations, on the question of what is next? what we can expect in the near term and the long term. And so to address these questions, to get the answers, we're gonna first hear from John Gottschalk, who is the Chief of the Operational Prediction Branch at the NOAA's National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center. And uh, he will be speaking on the latest climate outlooks. And then John will be followed by David Welch from the Lower Mississippi River Forecast Center, who will provide additional river forecast information. So I'm going to turn it over to you, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Viva, uh, very much. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to be pre presenting the uh, sh both shorter term and longer term uh, CPC outlooks and also the latest update on uh, La Nina conditions as well as drought. And so this uh, slide currently is one of our shorter range forecasts for the days uh, eight to 14 peer, eight to 14 day period for temperature and precipitation. Um, this was released yesterday. These are updated each day at by 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, they indicate probabilities for either the above normal, near normal or below normal category for both temperature and precipitation. Uh, temperature on the left, precipitation on the right. Uh, warm shades uh, for temperature favoring above normal temperatures and uh, cooler shades indicating below normal temperatures. And for the period from November 25th uh, through December 1st, which these, this forecast uh, covers, generally favoring warmer conditions than we're seeing right now across much of the West, uh, near normal conditions through much of the Mississippi Valley during the period, um, and residual uh, below normal, cooler than normal temperatures across the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. And uh, more importantly, with respect to precipitation, um, above normal precipitation as shown in the green shades, is uh, likely to be uh, in place uh, for the Pacific Northwest, uh, much of the West Coast actually with um, a renewed um, onshore flow um, with slight tilt towards positive to above normal precipitation as well into the Northern Rockies and very Northern High Plains. However, there will continue to be general um, dryness favored uh, for much of the South Central part of the country from the Southwest eastward to the uh, Western parts of the Ohio Basin. Um, these uh, the below normal area that's highlighted there are relatively uh, light shades indicating just um, relatively modest shifts in the probabilities towards below normal from normal or climatological probabilities. If you go to the next slide, please, uh, looking a little further out into the subseasonal range. First, with respect to the week two U.S. hazards outlook, I won't spend much time on here uh, today, but wanted to note that these are also produced daily uh, for any extreme related events. Uh, with respect to heavy precipitation, uh, rainfall, or uh, snowfall, as well as any other uh, hazard factors with respect to temperatures, extreme cold, for example. Um, in this particular uh, forecast from yesterday, the only real region or area to highlight that may impact um, this discussion would be potentially uh, a slight risk for heavy snowfall in some of the northern rocky areas and the extreme western areas of the upper uh, Missouri, Missouri Basin. Next slide, please. So as we go more into the uh, subseasonal time range for the 
uh, week three and four temperature and precipitation outlooks. Our next official outlook will be, will be released tomorrow. Uh, but I did want to show the latest model predictions that um, are significant in informing that outlook. Um, these are two different models, um, one uh, from the Europeans in the, in the left and from um, the U.S. on the right. Um, this is for the two-week average period from December 3rd to the 16th, just to try to give a gauge a little further out. The tendency or uh, general forecast skill for this time range is less than what I showed for week two, but it does uh, can inform um, what we may see during this period. And uh, just very quickly with temperature, generally a, a above normal uh, pattern favored from both of the models in this particular case during that period. Uh, with respect to precipitation, uh, you'll notice generally along the southern tier of the U.S., from parts of the southwest, uh, parts of Texas, and along the Gulf Coast and the southeast, there's generally most agreement between these two particular uh, modeling systems for favored uh, below normal precipitation. This is certainly consistent uh, with ongoing La Nina conditions. But as you shift further to the north, which is often the case during uh, La Nina winters, and in this region, um, there's more of a more lighter shades or muted shades for either uh, below normal precipitation in the browns and above normal precipitation with the greens. And you can see very, very muted colors across much of the area of interest, uh, the upper Mississippi Valley, uh, much of the Missouri River Basin, as well as parts of the Ohio River Basin. There does to be some agreement in this period for potentially wetter conditions in some parts of the uh, Ohio River Basin, but these probabilities are, are quite low, and so confidence and reliability um, also low. Um, next slide, please. So as we start to look for the longer seasonal uh, timeframe uh, outlooks for what we may expect, uh, I wanted to give a brief update on uh, the La Nina conditions first in the upper left shows the average ocean surface temperatures or sea surface temperature departures from normal. Uh, you can see uh, across the middle part of that plot, the blue shades indicate that La Nina conditions both in the ocean and the atmosphere remain quite strong. Uh, we're under a La Nina advisory that's expected to continue. Uh, these anomalies are ranging are, are more at the moderate level for La Nina's currently as they have for much of the summer. Um, the plot on the right shows um, a cross section along the equator where the blue shades indicate colder than normal water at depth uh, to about half to about 150, 200 meters in the east central Pacific, uh, warmer water farther out to the west. Um, the, the reason this is important is this is the uh, fuel uh, for continuation of what any conditions at the surface, meaning the cooler temperatures on the ocean surface uh, region. And so it's, it's likely that this La Nina event will continue uh, through the winter months. If you go to the next slide with the latest uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation outlook, uh, we expect to be in La Nina conditions uh, through the winter, January, February, March uh, 2022, 2023 season. And that's shown by the blue bars, which indicate on the left uh, axis percent chance. And, and on the, the, the uh, sorry, the X axis on the bottom there, um, the three month season, overlapping seasons uh, for JFM is an example. Uh, still maintaining La Nina conditions uh, with respect to the ocean. And then the gray bars indicate a more likelihood for uh, and some neutral conditions as we enter the spring months of 2023. So La Nina is a part of the outlook and conditions um, through the, the winter months this year for the third straight year. Next slide, please. And so uh, the latest December and January, February seasonal temperature and precipitation outlooks are shown here. Uh, the shading is as similar as described earlier, both temperature and precipitation. Uh, just very quickly with precipitation, the temperature uh, favoring below normal temperatures along the northern tier to the Great Lakes um, with generally warmer conditions across the south. This is typical for uh, La Nina conditions, uh, highest odds for above normal temperatures across the southeast. Um, with respect and most importantly with precipitation, um, first uh, you'll notice um, uh, a pattern very consistent uh, with the La Nina. We, we use other factors, which I'll show in a second, uh, but generally favoring above normal precipitation for the Great Lakes, much of the Ohio Valley, into the upper Mississippi Valley, and westward to the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rocky, Rockies. It's important, however, that um, for a few things. One, typically the above normal precipitation in the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes can sometimes come later on in the winter, more in the January, February, March period. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind. And second, um, even though there's green shading across the northern plains um, and the upper Mississippi Valley, those, that's only a very slight tilt away from climatological odds. Um, there's quite a bit of, of variability and um, 
with respect to historical forecast skill and the information we use, as well as the typical impacts that we see from one La Nina to, to another, very variable. Uh, so the odds are very, there's low, lower confidence in that region. And finally, as most people are aware, generally La Nina conditions uh, favoring below normal precipitation along the southern tier of, of the U.S. Uh, there is a bowing of increased probabilities for dryness into the parts of the central plains, but the highest odds are typically across uh, Texas and parts of the southeast, uh, including northern, northern Florida. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> in addition to La Nina, um, we, we make use of other things, of course, and uh, we make use of a, a number of short-term climate uh, prediction models. And my intent is not to go through all these small images here. It's more to make a, a point that um, we have a number of different modeling systems that are available to us, ensemble modeling systems, uh, and we look for various things such as consistency from one month to the next in the suite of uh, model prediction, as well as a consistency among modeling systems themselves in a given monthly outlook. And if you just focus uh, mainly on the top row in the middle plot, which is a probability forecast utilizing all this information, and you can see it's uh, not surprisingly very consistent with background La Nina conditions that we typically see when we average over multiple La Nina events over the last 50 to 70 years, generally drier along the southern tier, as I showed, and also the two main areas most likely, uh, typically for above normal precipitation, the northern Rockies, uh, and also the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes. On the right-hand side, um, it's important to note, since we switched the new base period uh, 1991 to 2020, the base period is what we use to reference our um, departures from normal and, and also determine what's normal for the 30-year period. Uh, when you take a look at the last 10 to 15 years compared to that 30-year normal, we, we, we have been seeing uh, positive or wetter uh, precipitation trends as highlighted in the green areas uh, on that map on the right, which is across parts of the Northern Plains, Ohio Valley and Great Lakes. And as we've seen in, in the last couple of years, that's not always the case, um, but that's generally the, the precipitation, latest precipitation trends. Next slide, please. With respect to the uh, drought outlook, um, we won't spend too much on time on this because it's consistent from the other information, but generally favoring improvement and removal of drought condition is indicated by the gray and green in the Ohio Valley region. Um, again, consistent with La Nina, the short-term um, climate model predictions, trends, and so on. Uh, generally, not much change. Um, again, there's not much strong signals either way across time scales right now for much of the upper Mississippi basin uh, and the Missouri uh, basin itself as well. Uh, generally, the drier conditions, drought development is expected to um, increase in coverage across additional areas not already in drought in the parts of the Southern Plains, Lower Mississippi Valley, and Southeast. Uh, final slide, please. So just very quickly to take a home message, um, La Nina is, continues to be in place, expected to remain in place through the winter. Above normal precipitation is most likely in the very upper northern Missouri level basin, northern Rockies, um, uh, Ohio Valley, and Great Lakes. Uh, least confidence is in the northern plains and the upper Mississippi Valley. For below normal precipitation, uh, favored at, at somewhat higher odds from the southern plains, far lower Mississippi Valley and the southeast, where additional drought development in some areas is possible by the end of February 2023. So thank you very much. I will turn it over to uh, David Welch, uh, my colleague from the Lower Mississippi River Forecast Center. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, David. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess go ahead and proceed on to the next slide. I'll, I'm gonna kind of give the, the longer term river forecast outlook as far as what we're seeing on our end. And I'm at the lower Mississippi River Forecast Center and we're downstream of, of four other river forecast centers. And basically we, we rely on forecasts from our upstream offices. We do quite a bit of coordination with our upstream offices and the Corps of Engineers up and down the rivers because basically everything trickles down to us and, and it's a highly regulated system, regulated system by the time it gets to us. So we're, we're relying on the information we get from all of our upstream partners. But as been said, the bulk of the flow comes from the Ohio, the upper Mississippi and the Missouri. Uh, while the Arkansas and, and Red do contribute 
the, the amounts that we tend to get from the Arkansas, the red don't tend to, they're not of the, the larger magnitude and don't tend to last as long, you know, as the inputs from the upper river. Next slide. And this is a, another way of looking at climatology on the river. And, and this is looking at events uh, that we've had on the river at Cairo, where the, the yellow is our action level stages, the orange are our flood stages in minor flood, the red at moderate, and then the, the darker color, major flood stages. And it's what it shows is that this time of year, September, October, November, tend to be kind of a, a quiet, more quiet time of the year in the lower flows, lower stages of the year. Uh, that 60% of the volume that we tend to see on the that comes out of the how it tends to be an average accumulation over the year. So we get a lot of that volume basically in the in the spring or late winter to spring months. Um, you know, a lot of that volume, basically quite a bit less of the volume in the, this time of the year in the September or October, November time frame. Uh, but the volume can shift from the upper mess in Missouri to the Ohio. It just happens that right now we're seeing lower flow on the Ohio about, well, during the October, November timeframe, we were seeing actually more flow coming out of the upper mess in Missouri than we were out of the Ohio. Next slide. And this is just a tab with your view of some of the, the current forecast stages well, the current stages, the forecast stages, and then comparison low water years, 20, comparing 2022 to 2012, 2000, and 1988. And while we did see some some record lows this year in 2022, you know, it should be noted that the duration of this event in, in low water events been substantially lower or shorter duration than the 1988 event. That was the 1988 was a much longer duration low water event than what we've had this year. Though the, the record lows that we are seeing or have seen in 2022 achieve those levels, it was for a, a much shorter duration than, than was seen in that year. Uh, another thing of note, you know, we're seeing you know, a current, a current rise or peak stages at Cairo this morning around 18 and a half feet based on the, the water that we got from Hurricane Nicole. The stages, you know, the, the forecast low stages on the lower portion of the river, you know, you'll notice that Vicksburg, Red River Landing and Baton Rouge, basically we're at the low stages right now. So that, that, that water that we're seeing at Cairo is gonna cause a kind of a slight to moderate rise at, on the middle portion, the lower portion of the river, and then basically turn around and drop back down. But so we're seeing the lowest stages on the river at the on the middle and lower end from Vicksburg down now, and should get a little bit of relief as that water makes its way through. Next slide. And this is a graphic just showing the rainfall that we've had over the past few weeks. Um, it's, below normal, but not, not zero. And then if you show the next slide, please. A, a good portion of the rainfall that we're seeing benefit from over the last, this past week is from Hurricane Nicole as it made, made landfall and, and just kind of clipped the, the Eastern portions of the Ohio River drainage area. And um, next slide. And this is based on yesterday's forecast. It's it still hasn't changed a lot from, or today's forecast hasn't changed much from yesterday's. We're currently at the peak stage this morning at Cairo at around 18 and a half feet. Uh, this forecast is our operational forecast. It's using 40, 48 hours of forecast rainfall and nothing beyond that. And the plot here shows our 14 day forecast. So we're basically at the peak stages this morning at Cairo uh, with decreasing stages they're gonna continue, you know, basically throughout the next 28 days. The plot shows 14 days, but we do a daily 28 day stage forecast. So, you know, in terms of, you know, river forecasts or 48 hour QPF forecast shows kind of a, a worst case scenario with 
with no additional rainfall beyond the, the 48 hour periods. Next slide. And as, as an analog year, uh, the Corps of Engineers shared a, a plot to us for the 2000 and 2001 you know, stages for Cairo. The, as an analog, 2000 transitioning in 2001 was a La Nina year, kind of similar to what we're seeing this year. And if you look at the, at the blue trace towards the end of the year, November, December, going it up into January, you'll notice that there were some some temporary rises at Cairo. You know, we're basically similar to this year. Cairo got up to around 20 feet, kind of like we're seeing this year, but then dropped back down following that, you know, and then saw additional rises in December. And then if you follow that purple trace on into the following year for 2001, so going back to the left of the plot, looking at January through February, you notice that we we didn't really see a consistent relief until we got into kind of the late January timeframe going into February, you know, before we saw persistent higher water conditions. Okay. And then also, if you note the average flows, you know, basically we tend to start to see increases in flows around the, the late November timeframe going on into December, January and beyond. Uh, in the winter time, the vegetation tends to die off and when we do get rainfall, the runoff is, tends to be more efficient. So we tend to see more runoff from those rain events going into this time of year. Next slide. And this is the, the Ohio River Outlook uh, that, is, that we get from the Ohio River Forecast Center. It's from the CFS climate model, and it incorporates 43 days of QPF or future rainfall. And you'll notice that basically where we're at today is we're basically starting to recede off the rainfall that we're at, that we have in the system today. And then we're, we're looking at over the next couple of weeks, kind of a, a downward trend with no additional or not a lot of significant rainfall in the forecast. You know, as you get off into the, the longer time frames, you do note that, or we note that the the average flows tend to start to, to increase based on the climate CFS V2 model, the climate model. So this is pretty much consistent with climatology and what we're seeing. You know, it's not a lot of flow, but it is more flow than what we're seeing now is, is what we're seeing for the trend. Next slide. And we also run a 16 day the forecast that uses 16 days of future forecast rainfall and the rainfall forecast is based off the North American Ensemble Forecast System mean. And we basically take that, our upstream offices run this through their models and they provide us the flows that we've run through the, the forecast on our downstream end. And although it's not a lot, it's not significant, you will note that, or note that in the the lower Ohio and the eastern portion of the Ohio River Valley, we are seeing some rainfall over the next 16 days. It's not, not significant, but it's also not zero. So it's, it's in the two to three inch range cumulative over the next couple of weeks. Next slide. What that looks like in the river by the time it's forecast to get on the ground and, and runs off down to our area, this is yes, based on yesterday's forecast, you'll note that the the operational forecast with two days of future rainfall is the, the yellow trace. And then the, the North American Ensemble mean forecast with 16 days of QPF for forecast rainfall is the orange colored hydrograph shows in the, in the two week to three to four week time frame, basically some maybe some additional relief, you know, or in terms of of rises. Now, what we're seeing this morning in this the latest run is the, the flows have decreased a little bit from what we had yesterday. So, I expect today's NAFE's forecast to drop down a little bit from what we see in this particular plot from yesterday. So, it gives us a longer term trend. It tends to verify better than our model with 48 hours of QPF because over the size and span of a, a drainage area, drainage area that spans the Missouri, Upper Mississippi, and Ohio, we tend to get rain somewhere across the basin. 
Next slide. And this plot shows our, our ESP climatology forecast. This is a 90-day forecast run that we run on the Ohio River at Cairo. And this is using historical flows from 1991 through 2019. So it's roughly a 28-year period of record. The, the blue trace that is the historical trace. So that is just the, basically we're showing the exceedance plot of stages based on the historical trace from 91 through 2019. The conditional trace that is shown with the darker line, the black triangles is based off current initial conditions, you know, as initialized off the forecast on Tuesday. And it is showing that we, even with this rise that we saw from Nicole, you know, based on the current stages on Tuesday, we're still below normal, you know, compared to that 28 year average. And if you look at the, basically the overall plot in terms of all different exceedance levels for different stages, you know, we're, we are still looking at a below normal forecast compared to those other years. Our ESP forecast system only incorporate 72 hours of future rainfall. So in, the, in terms of a 90 day forecast, what you're seeing here is more or less climatology. You know, we, there's, not, there's not future rainfall that's incorporated into this. This is, is more or less just showing you what we see on average based on initial conditions. You know, with, with a forecast trace that is initialized off initial conditions. So it shows that we're running and looking at below average conditions still for the next 90 days. Next slide. And this is from that same model run. It's, a, it's the same 90-day ESP climatology. It's a, a different way of looking at it, broken down by week. And if you look at the, basically the mean, you know, the 50 to 75 percentile mean, you know, we, on average, we tend to see an increasing trend uh, from, from where we're at now, mid-October, you know, going out through the next 90 days through December and into January, we, on average, we we tend to tend to see an increasing trend. Next slide. And just some some final summary key points. Um, we are the lowest levels on the Mississippi River on the middle to lower end tend to occur climatologically in October and November, and it's, it's just unfortunate that we. The setup that we had leading into our low water time period just exaggerated the low water conditions that we're seeing now in what is our, our normally low time period. Stages tend to start to increase in December and beyond, you know, just based on climatology. You know, the current extended rainfall trends tend to support an increasing trend in average stages. You know, we're, we're going into the winter time where the vegetation is dying off. So any rain that we do get will tend to be more efficient in terms of generating runoff. And with that, that's, I believe that's all I have with my last slide. Right. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you to you, John, as well for your presentation. All right, folks, I wanna just do a little bit of a time check. We are running a little bit over, as you probably have noticed. Um, we're probably gonna stay on for another 10 minutes just to get through some of these questions. Um, we did receive uh, quite a few questions in the questions box, so thank you for that. Um, please remember to use the questions box and go to webinar in the control panel. Um, speakers, I'm gonna ask you, please feel free to turn your cameras back on and join us in our Q&A uh, panel, or if you prefer to turn the camera on when you are answering a question, that works as well. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to my NIDIS colleague, Meredith Muth, from the NIDIS program as well. And Meredith will actually be moderating this Q&A session. So, Meredith, over to you. Great. Thank you, Viva. And such a tremendous amount of fantastic information. It's no wonder that we are running a little bit behind. Our first question is for the U.S. Coast Guard, Captain Carrero. Uh, you mentioned that some restrictions have been eased along the river. Could you please elaborate on what restrictions have been eased? Hi, good afternoon again. Captain Carrero here. Um, sector Lower Mississippi River, they issue a marine safety information broadcast just recently. 
and uh, we talk about northbound toes, uh, no more than five wide, with a 10 bars draft limit. Uh, for southbound toes, we're looking at a maximum of five wide, bars draft no more than 9.6, nine feet, six inches. Um, so that's some of the restrictions that we were able to lift. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were doing, it was a nine feet restriction. Now we increase it to 9.6. Um, and right now what we're looking is when the Memphis gauge is above minus three, we're gonna move to a maximum of six wide barges, and then we'll go with a draft of 10.6. So right now, like I said, we're looking at the gauges. Uh, as soon as we see an increase in the water levels, we're gonna be increasing the size of the toes uh, for the white and also for the draft. Great, thank you for that response. Uh, the next few questions I'm going to direct towards the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Others are welcome to chime in. The first one is, is related to groundwater, which we really didn't talk about much. Would practices that increase groundwater strengthen capacity to manage the surface waters and reservoirs to help maintain the river level along the Mississippi? I guess there's some potential for that, but um, as we were looking at operational ways to maybe get some more water in the river, uh, the amount available to release at that time was not enough to make much of a dent, or if it was, if we could make a dent, it wouldn't last very long. So, um, you know, it's possible if, if that groundwater would somehow help provide more water to the reservoirs, but uh, it, it's hard to say. Thank you. Um, I'm going to keep you here for another question from someone who works on marsh restoration in South Louisiana. And this question is related to sediment flow. How will these conditions affect near term, in particular next year, sediment flow southward? I work on marsh restoration and am concerned about sediment fluxes and availability for ongoing work in the Louisiana region. So most sediment moving in the river moves during flood conditions. Uh, we heard that there are, you know, there is sediment moving around as the channel is shifting during these low flow times. Uh, so uh, another good point to make is that when we dredge in the lower river, that, that sediment stays in the river. It's not passed off behind a levee or anything. So depending on what flood uh, situation we see in the spring, that will drive how much how much the sediment conditions change uh, relative to normal next year. And I'll do one more question for you. Um, this is related to the underwater pinnacles. About. What will be the responses to challenges at negative five compared to concern at negative seven feet? And if it's helpful, we can bring that slide back up as well. Yeah. Uh, I can talk to that, Don. Um, we don't, if you want to bring the slide up, that's fine for the audience, but uh, our response is not any different in that we would just continue to prioritize those dredging assets to those locations. The concern of the difference between the minus five and the minus seven becomes the, the available width in the river because of those uh, rock structures that are in there. So we would continue to prioritize dredging assets to those locations. And, it, and as I had stated earlier, it could lead to extended closures because a dredge is going to have to complete that operation before it moves to the next hotspot. It won't be able to go on and off for 12 hours at a time, uh, but there will not be a difference in our approach. Okay, great. Um, I have, I'm going to direct the next question over to Brad from the U.S. Department of Agriculture related to barge transport cost. Were the high barge transport costs around September, was it just a result of lower weight limits and low water, or were there other significant factors? Like any market prices, I think there's a little bit of speculation involved in that. So a little bit of panic may have contributed to those very high spot prices. One thing to remember is that producers can delay moving the product down the river, but only to a point 
So if there's a temptation to wait until next spring, you have to remember that you could be competing then with South America corn and soybeans. And so there is some urgency to move the corn and soybeans downstream before the next crop cycle begins in the Southern Hemisphere. And since I have you, Brad, one more question uh, related to barge spot rates. What are some of the reasons behind the recent drop in barge spot rates shown in the USDA data? Again, not being an economic expert, I think there was just some initial panic there that drove those spot prices incredibly high in a short period of time. And I think as slight improvement occurred in the river levels, along with uh, better, as, as the management of the crisis developed, I think folks realized that they could move products downstream, albeit maybe a little bit more cautiously and slowly. And I think, again, like any market factors, think stock market, think commodity prices, some of that is driven by panic and concern. So I think, uh, I think as things normalized a little bit more, we got a little deeper into this crisis and spot prices came back down. Thanks, Brad. I'd now like to shift back to the river system and the movement of goods. Um, I'm gonna direct this one to Paul from Waterways Council. Others are welcome to add in. Does the movement of goods through the river system increase with the temporary bumps that we see in river flow? Are the movement of products timed with these increased flows or is it too risky? Well, most of these contracts are let out months and months, sometimes years ahead of time. So the the vagaries of a, a, a one week bump, for example, in, in river levels doesn't have much impact on um, on the market. Um, I would go back to Brad's last comment and add, just add this, the timing of this low water event is a little bit different as well, particularly with agriculture. We saw last uh, time, 2012, it happened much later. And so you saw much more corn and soybean going into makeshift uh, uh, storage facilities. And um, so if, if there is a silver lining, if you will, I think you know the timing uh, was a little bit better as far as uh, getting ag products out to export this year. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, I'm going to now put it, this is a little bit of a broader question related to climate impacts uh, and the future of the, the basin. So climate, and so this is open to anyone, Climate scientists say the region will continue to experience extreme droughts in years to come. How can we be better prepared for challenges like this going forward? There was mention of having to deal with both more floods and more droughts. Um, do you have any recommendations based on your experience, how we can build resilience and be better prepared in the future? Well, I'll tackle that, um, or at least part of it. The premise anyway is we have I think the premise is we've got more and more extreme weather conditions. Um, and while the barge industry can't impact the weather conditions, they certainly can impact the way that they react to them. And my answer would be it, it, it makes even more sense to use barge transportation because it is the lowest carbon footprint. The EPA estimates that uh, carbon dioxide makes up as much as 80% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Now, 27% of that is from the transportation sector, but only 2% is from, uh, of that 27 is from towboats. So barges are actually greening the supply chain. And if you want to look at um, carbon footprint, it makes a lot of sense to continue to utilize barges in moving products. Uh, it, it is, again, the most environmentally friendly mode of of moving uh, bulk commodities that we all use every day. The products have to move. That's uh, not negotiable. Um, you know, just three years ago, we saw stark high water levels. So uh, the industry adapts to what Mother Nature provides us. But I'll let some of the other experts talk about what else could be done. Meredith, I, I can take part of that. Uh, we, we saw an example this summer of what we may be seeing in the future. 
because in the midst of, and I think one of the earlier speakers talked about this, in the midst of very severe drought, we had some extreme rainfalls in a few locations, Eastern Kentucky, uh, St. Louis, but they were extreme events in the middle of an ongoing drought. Uh, the other part that was not brought up that is an example of the, of the problem with our more extremes in the hydrologic system was the evapotranspiration or the loss of water from the surface to the atmosphere. Not only did we have a lack of rainfall, warm temperatures also removed a lot of water from the surface so there was even less water available uh, to run off or to keep the soils moist to provide runoff later. Uh, how we manage that in the future is going to be a very difficult issue because uh, we could certainly see more extremes that happen more quickly uh, moving back and forth. And I'd like to recognize that's Dennis Toddy, who is from the USDA Midwest Climate Hub. And I think with that, we are 10 minutes over. Um, we've been able to uh, respond to some questions. Apologies to those of you we have not. If you do want have any other specific questions, you will be able feel free to follow up with us. I will now pass it back over to Viva for closing comments. Thank you, speakers. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. So before we conclude this webinar, I would like to give a big thank you to everyone who shared their time, um, was generous with their time and, and provided us their expertise today, and everyone who worked behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. Um, in particular, I would like to recognize our wonderful speakers today, Colonel Panier, Captain Carrero, Paul, Brad, Don, Victor, John, and David. Um, we will provide, as uh, we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will provide a summary of this recording along with a link to the webinar recording via email, and it will also be posted on drought.gov. This recap will include links to resources that you might find helpful in monitoring drought conditions in the Lower Mississippi River Basin. And a few of those are being posted in the chat right now. But please, um, please go to drop.gov to get the full suite of those resources. Following the webinar, um, please take a few minutes to provide feedback on the information you heard today. And so from all of us at NIDIS and our partners at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Coast Guard, NOAA's National Weather Service, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you and have a great weekend.